Welcome to 10 Songs, where each week we dive into the connections to the music that you love, from cover versions and little known gems to those tracks you just skipped over. We'll show you the common thread across the music you love today and help you find a new favorite with just 10 songs. Hey, everybody. Welcome to 10 Songs. I'm your host, Stephen Rose, and with me, as always, is Peter Rising. Peter, how are you today? I'm very good, Stephen. How's things with you today? Things are good. And we have a very, very special guest with us today is the one, the only, Marco Peroni. Marco, thank you Hello. for joining us today. How are you? I'm, I'm all right. It's, I'm, I'm okay. It's Sunday afternoon in the country, so I've kind of um, been knocking about the house, walking from, it in, from room to room, not knowing what to do with myself. And whereabouts well, are you in the world, Marco? I am in, a, a, I am in the picturesque yet deathly dull village of Sutton Scarsdale. I don't know where that is. No, I don't know where it is either. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Derbyshire, isn't it? In, it's, in, 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 it's in between Sheffield and... Sheffield and... Um, what's the other place? Nottingham. Well, I know Sheffield, so I know where that's at. Yeah, so yeah Sheffield and Nottingham uh, in the UK. So you've had an amazing career. Um, I mean, you started by playing with Susie and the Banshees at their first show, Adam yeah. Matt, you've worked with Sinead O'Connor, The Wolfmen, yeah. amazing stuff. But I'd love to go back because you have this amazing sound. You sort of have taken surf rock and, you know, the old rockabilly kind of thing and mixed it with punk rock and have... Been and, glam really rock. Amazing. and glam rock, absolutely. So I'd love to kind of talk about, you know... I got into music about this. It sounds like about the same year you did that. I mean, I loved music from an early age, but there was a point for you. It sounds like kind of 1972 was the and year. So it was really kind of, yeah, we, we had, yeah. Yeah. We had, you know, David Bowie, Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust. We had, you know, Lou Reed and That's Transformer, cool. which is one of the greatest albums I think ever. Uh, yeah. You know, it's out there. Black Sabbath did their fourth album. For your um, pleasure. Yeah, for your pleasure, Roxy Music, um, some really amazing stuff. So, what were you listening to? Let's start with what you were listening to that really started to to influence your sound. Well, when 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 again, seventy two, seventy three. We'll we'll talk about like the seventies, T Rex, etc. All those things you just said. Um, also, because of no obviously no internet in those in those days, you had to. Yeah, but I basically just went and bought records because I liked the cover. And I mm -hmm. kept going back to that one. Oh, I like that one with a big banana on the front. There you go. Yeah, Velvet yeah. Underground. Yeah. Or, or or the incredibly beautiful women on the front that Roxy Music did. Exactly. Well, no, Roxy, Roxy were different because I saw them on telly. Mm -hmm. I'd seen them on Top of the Pops. And obviously I'd seen Bowie on Top of the Pops. And Bowie did Transform. So I thought, oh, I bet by that. I didn't know who that bloke was. Yeah. <laughs> And the fact that, you know, Iggy and Bowie and Lou were all friends. They were, you know, L L David's producing well, their really albums. Friends, were they? Well, yeah, no, I guess a little bit more and a little bit less. Yeah. So, it, but then um, Link Ray was another uh, album. And we were talking about this last week that you heard that sound and it, it was one of those things that hit you. No, you know. I didn't hear the sound. I saw the cover. You saw the cover. Okay. <laughs> Was, and you uh, took it home and you put it on, and what happened? I thought, wow, this is amazing. There's two two great things about this. One, it's really fucking brilliant. It is also really fucking easy. So, yeah. Which, <laughs> which for a li very limited teenage guitarist is really important. So how old were you when you first started playing? Uh, it would have been 72. All right. The year I was born. <laughs> there you go. So I was... I would have been 13. Yeah. All right. I think so you're 13 is a good teenage age, I think, to start anything. I agree. Uh, and it's very, you're, you're a lot, you're very, very open to things. So as you start to play, you're playing Link Ray. What else, you know, how does that evolve into sort of, you know, punk hits five, you know, four or five years later? And. Who are you hanging out with? What's happening that's taking you I'm to blend all these with, different I'm, genres? I'm, I'm hanging out with two two very different groups of people. I'm, I'm going. I'm hanging out with, uh, you know, obviously my school friends. 
I lived mm-hmm. in a, I lived in a place called Harrow. We we moved from Camden Town. I'm actually from Central London, but we'd moved to, mm. to Harrow, which is a a suburb. So I was hanging out with my school friends, and uh, you know, as much as I got on with my school friends, of course, I mean, I, they didn't really. Um, I don't know. I didn't. I, 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 it wasn't quite enough. I was always. I was always been looking for something else. I was looking for something else today around the house. Um, so I got into, and it's very strange to describe. Where I lived, there were a bunch of guys. There was like some remnants of Teddy Boys. You know what Teddy Boys? Like guys. I don't. Oh. That one I don't know. Uh, English thing, then. <laughs> oh, God, this is going to take a long time to explain. They were, they, they were, they were, they were, uh, English youth cult, they were, um, you know, they, they died out by that. These these were these were old guys. These were, they, okay. they were sort of, you know, like kind of very low IQs who had never changed. Their t- you know, so they had big, you know, big mutton chops. And, Got it. Um, dogs on leads. Uh, okay. <laughs> big I got it. Yeah. Yeah, they were kind of the old '50s guys, and yeah, yeah. you know, sort of kept that that look and feel, um, you know, yeah, into later life. So I get it. As opposed to the mods that were very clean cut and different sort of look that was also well, hitting about that time. Different. You know, yeah. I mean, oh no, I know it is, but it's almost the opposite extreme of it in many ways. And there was another thing where I lived is that mods started turning into skinheads, which is a thing that's sort of been forgotten that, you know, like there was, there were, there were like skinheads with the shaved heads. And then suddenly, suddenly the skinheads started wearing suits and riding scooters. Yeah. But I wasn't one of them. I wasn't one of anything really, but I did like, although I didn't, I hated rock and roll music, but, and I had to find out where they got these clothes. So I I found uh, Malcolm Vivian shop, they rock. And that's down. Well, that was down on what Connaby Street, down that way. No, no, Kings Road, end of Kings Road. Kings Road. Okay. So, for those who don't know, Malcolm McLaren is the you know kind of founder producer for a lot of bands, including you know the Sex Pistols, and was very influential and worked with you and Bow Wow Wow. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And and was understood the concept that it is as much how you look. As how uh, you know, and uh, as well as how you sound, and that yeah. having a look and a great sound set you apart from everybody else. And with you know good musicianship, you could really you know turn heads and do things. Or so bad or even bad musicianship for some of them too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for every you know for every you and for every Steve Cook, there are some mediocre musicians, but that gave it that edge, and that's what set it apart. Was you didn't have to be this fully formed musician if you could play some chords and if you had that grit and that angst and were willing to get out there you could really make something no, that happen was, and you that, that, was great, that was the great thing about punk i mean music and fashion existed at that time it's very different two different things and i was i was i was already playing guitar but i didn't know anybody else who played guitar i didn't know anybody at the, at the shop played guitar mm-hmm. or had any interest in music and um, I was in Denmark Street looking at guitars I couldn't afford, and I suddenly saw Vivian Westwood walking wow. up the street. And I wow. Said, Hello. Out, and she had a, this amazing kind of lyrics fur coat on and white hair and everything, which is not something it's not something you see today, but you can certainly didn't say it there. And she had these coffee cups. And I said, hello, why are you in this street? This is, this is for hairy musicians. This is for... You know, she said, oh, Malcolm's got a new band and they're rehearsing across the street. Come and say hello. And I thought, oh, um, all, all right. And <laughs> <laughs> if Vivian Westwood says, follow me, you follow <laughs> her. Well, nothing else to do. Um, <laughs> a very good point. <laughs> so I met the band. I think I'd, 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 I did know Glenn before. So I met the band. And they were just sitting around smoking fags and drinking coffee. <laughs> nice rotten wasn't there. So I thought, well, I'm not going to intrude on somebody else's, you know, um, uh, rehearsal and I left I was, also I was, I was painfully shy painfully shy mm. and these folks were like I seemed like a lot older than me although they were I mean, they would have been 19 and I was 17 yeah mm. so at this point what was your appearance and your, your look like did you have the green hair at this point 
And I, I've never had green hair, but pink and black hair. I think I had pink and black ah. hair. I read nice. somewhere you had green, so that's obviously wrong. <laughs> no, I once said he's had, I was really menacing, I had green hair. No, I never, I, maybe I did. I, I, I had lots of colours, <laughs> hence why it's like this now. Got it. Um, no, it was black and pink. Cool. Um, so, so you meet up with them. And how does that start to change your trajectory at that part? Because within the next few years, well, you're on stage playing this Tuesday what, and everything else. Folks, what are they doing? Right. What are you doing? <laughs> Dressed like this. That's <laughs> this awesome. is not, you know, there's not you this is like our, our scene and and you know early music and, and the sort of London pub scene or you know they don't they're not connected, you know. Right. So yeah. so I was confused. Um but anyway, a couple of weeks later I went to see them play at the Hundred Club and it was just as so many people have ever said, you know, it blew your mind. You think this is, I can't speak. Right. So brilliant. I couldn't actually hear them, but that, that wasn't, that wasn't really important. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it was, yeah. The visual spectacle of being there and seeing these guys up on stage playing the way that they were playing, could, also, you know, interacting with the audience in a way I that first, bands don't do. The bands didn't interact. Well, they didn't interact with the audience. To see the lead singer, who looked, who looked so amazing at the time, singing with his hands in his pockets, being completely bored, was, I mean, it was very, very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to everybody else who's being a little more frantic love up me, on love stage. Me, love me, love me, and they weren't that at all. No. Yeah, completely the opposite of the Beatles who was pandering. These guys are like, we're up here, we're going to do our thing, and you can watch us if you want. If you don't want to, yeah, all F you. you. Fuck off. Yeah. yeah. So who else? Who else is there? You're starting to meet some of the folks that are going to become big players in your life a little bit later. So what? Who? Who else is there at that scene? Because it's amazing. Know, I mean, it's, it was always Susie and Steve. Sid, yeah. Um, Steve Severin. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, Steve Severin, Sid Vicious. A lot of them, you know, a lot of the people became major players. I mean, I, I can't remember who was at the first gig. It was like three people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So how did you and Susie connect and how did you end up going from this and a guy who was, you know, playing to all of a sudden being on stage with, with her at their first gig and going, Hey, this is something I think I want to continue to do and do more. Okay, so well, how did that I, happen? Mean, can, I can't really sort of get the chronology in order, but you'll be able to look it up if you really want it's it fine. to. Um, one Saturday afternoon, uh, I went to see Queen live in Hyde Park. They were doing, a free gig in Hyde Park. It was when Bohemian Rhapsody was out. Ah, okay. So that would be around 76, I yeah, think. Yeah, 76. It was 76. Yeah, that sounds about right. And I was just walking around, and I remember having, I had pink shoes on, pink pink loaf. I was, I was sort of dressed in black, but with pink shoes and with black and pink hair, I'm sure. Um, so I saw a guy dressed in a green sari with green hair. And... As you do. As you do. And uh, this was Philip Salon, um, a very old friend of mine. And he went, oh, hello, darling. Oh, hello. Oh, what are you doing here? I said, well, come and see. I didn't know him. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, come and meet, you know, I'm with Susie and Steve and come and meet Susie and Steve, you know. And anyway, so, uh, you know, I hung out with them for a while. We got so bored, we went home. We didn't actually see Queen. Um <laughs> All right. I was like them anyway. Um, it was just a free show. So we went back to, somehow we got back to Bromley, like Billy Idol's house. Billy, Billy was at home. We just sort of pressed his house. And he said, and he was sort of like, uh, he was sort of like, it was like, oh, thank God you're here. Because on Tuesday, I've been roped into doing this gig with Susie and Stephen Sid. And I really, really don't want to do it because I think they're idiots. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, just, uh, Billy at that time had some, you know, like had some sort of delusional belief that he actually had a, a future career of some sort. So, and he, he sort of thought, well, I'm not going to do it. I, I, you know, I want to do it. I want to be a serious punk musician. I don't want to play with these people who cannot play at all. And, and someone who I think is a borderline psychopath. 
said, do you, do you want to do it? And I said, yeah, all right. After that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this, would have been, this would have been Sunday night. The gig was Tuesday. And this and this this was at the what the one hundred club yeah, punk right. festival okay yeah. yeah and what did you play what what songs did you play nothing we didn't you have just any... got up there and just kind of jammed and made up stuff or what well, happened our original concept which I thought was a brilliant concept was to try and do cover versions of songs we didn't like but... <laughs> okay so just do them faster and louder kind of thing. Yeah, but we couldn't even do that. I was—I mean, I still could play a bit. I could play a bit. Steve can play at all. Sue's never, Sue's never sang in her life. Um, so Sid sort of just said, well, we tried to, we went to the Clashes rehearsal studio, this place in uh, Camden Town, Camden Lock. And we we used their gear. And we didn't use their gear, they wouldn't let us. Uh, we used the band called the Subway Sex Gear. All right. Well, they said, like, actually, uh, you know, was, you know, I love the pistols, I like the banshees, and I love the subway sect. The world's most bored band. I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I know, you, you have to check them out. It's absolutely no effort, no interest, no enthusiasm. <laughs> It's amazing. I remember I remember the first time I saw Jesus Mary Chain, they walked out and they turned around and spent the whole concert with their backs to the audience on the Psycho Candy Tour. It was like, it was I probably like that. Yeah, so, and people are like, what the hell is going on? And, I'm sure that Jesus and Chain Daisy uh, I'm sure that these Jesus and Daisy Chain being the velvet underground. Well, yeah, and that was the whole thing behind the velvets when they're playing movies over them and things like that. That yeah. was Andy's thing and Andy got yeah. that too. It's about being a showman and having showmanship as well yeah. as musicianship. Well, I bet the Jesus and Mary Chains were all dressed in black. Oh, yeah, they were if I remember yeah. correctly. And, this was like, you said, know. Some way said couldn't even do that. They were just all dressed in black. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they wore, they just went ahead and did. So That's how the did this statement we can make about anything? Like... Exactly. <laughs> so were you all? I'm assuming you're also hanging out. You're also hanging out with Malcolm at this point, Malcolm mm. McLaren. So how does that turn into what's going to kind of get you with Adam and the rest of the band? How did that come together? That was a long time. That was that was what seemed a long time later. Right? About what, 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 that was seventy six. So actually, start. Well, no, it was three years later. Yeah. So what are you doing in that three years? Who are you playing I'm with? About, I'm bumming about. I'm bumming, I'm bumming about and, and, and generally getting completely involved in the punk scene until about mid-77. And then there was a sort of turnaround in mid-77. And I decided I didn't like punk anymore. Um, mm. And there were two seminal albums, which you think, okay, this has really changed. I mean, the three seminal albums that I heard okay. that, were, that were really anti-punk, which was Trans Europe Express, Low, and of course, the greatest album, one of the greatest albums ever made, The Idiot. Yes. All right. So let's let let's take a step back. So you've got Kraftwerk, which I agree is there would be no '80s music, no oh, new yeah. wave, none of that without Kraftwerk, no EDM, and they're a band that does not get the credit that they deserve because Trans Europe Express it. and they don't get mm -hmm. it. Uh, you know, the, those albums, The Model, which there is a great punk version of that done by 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 big black they do this amazing version of the model rammstein does one as well mm. such an amazing I had, band I had a great style i about five years ago i went to craftwork fan convention i did a sort of uh, i did a kind of question and answer at, and um then we went for a, a walk through Düsseldorf, and we went down the street and there was a grey Volkswagen, a grey, you know, the split window Volkswagen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Grey Volkswagen part. And the guy said, guess whose car that is? I said, it's Florian Schneider's. <laughs> How did you know that? <laughs> because it was a grey Volkswagen with a split window. There you Who's, go. Who else is going? Who else could have that car? It's yeah. I was going to say it's 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 either Ralph or Florian. So that yeah. that's insane. So Kraftwerk, which that's awesome, and then you have Low, which is David Bowie and Brian Eno at their best. Part of the Low Lodger Heroes trio of albums that really 
changed, you know, brought brought the thin white Duke, uh, really helped to move from Ziggy Stardust to that. So how does Low, which is one of my favorite Bowie albums, sort of affect you, uh, you know, differently than... And I can see the relationship between Kraftwerk and Bowie with, with the synth stuff and what Eno is doing. So how does that album take it a little bit further? Because The Idiot is completely different than both of those. So I, I want to talk about well, Low. For really. They're in the same same vein, aren't they? They're very, kind of, they're very dark. Yes. They're very but, 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 but Iggy has a frantic energy. And that album, you have sort of the beginnings of the Burundi drum beat on some of those tracks on The Idiot. You have amazing guitar work as opposed to Low, which, yes, is a very dark, but it's a much slower album at yeah. times, uh, where The Idiot is absolutely 100% in your face based on MC5 and a lot of those bands. So how do those... What was it about those three albums well, the thing that, that really... What, did it? what had happened with Punk, what I felt, it, 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 it had become idiotic. Mm -hmm. These albums were not idiotic. No. No. Warzaw and, you know, Breaking Glass, Speed of Life. These are amazing tracks that yeah. are like nothing else out there. So does that make you want to change what you're yeah. playing, how you're playing, yeah. the amount that you're playing? Yeah. All of it. All of it. So so that that was the moment when you go. I'm going to get serious about this. I'm going to I'm going to start to master the guitar, or is it just that you wanted to experiment more and try to find your own sound? Um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to make records like that. I thought I'm not I'm not there. I'm as much as I love the Ramones and still love the Ramones. Everything oh, seems yeah. to be based like the, on, around the Ramones, and everything right. was just one, two, three, four. There, yeah. You know. And I hate the bloody Queen and all that. And it's like I just can't sit and you know and I kind of. It, Leather jackets and Dr. Martins. I thought this the whole the whole scene is just dead. But I, I, unlike a lot of people, when they find that their scene is dead, they become um, resentful. And it's like you've taken my scene away, you've taken my life away. I didn't mm. think that. I thought, great, well I've done this now, but it's kind of over. Now I've got to move on. All right. So now, so now you're focusing. They're Different albums are affecting you. How does this lead into meeting Adam and, and starting with them and moving in that direction? Well, then, then I started a band. Then we started a band um, called Rima Rima, which was this basic, basically a kind of like fusion of the idiot, the velvet underground, and and, and just sort of noise, really. It was mm -hmm. just sort of noise. But after a year or so of that, I thought... <clears throat> and then there were other things happening, like... New Order, not not New Order. Mm. Joy Division. Joy Division. Joy Division. Yeah. At the time, I hated New Order. It was just grey and just like boring and um, not stylish, not fun. And uh, so I left Rima Rima. I had a brief dalliance with almost rejoining the Banshees, but then again, I thought this is really not what I want to do. And you know, and you, you just you have to sit down and go, what do you want to do? I want to be on top of the pops, like Mark Boland. Okay. And I want to wear, you know, feathers and makeup, and I just, I want, I basically, want to do glam rock. Okay. <laughs> and, and and glam was huge. I, you know, T Rex is leading it. Roxy is doing some really amazing thing. Bowie is sort of leading the charge in many many ways. And there's a, you know, a lot of other great bands that are coming in. So mm. you're now sitting with Malcolm and. No, I wasn't is... with Malcolm. No? Okay. At this point, was this when the first incarnation of Adam and the Ants were <coughs> just breaking up when Adam was famously fact sacked from his own group? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I mean, I, I didn't really know Adam. I'd met him a few times. I didn't really know him. Uh, yeah. I, I, was friends, I was good friends with Andy Warren, the bass player. So I used to go and see the Ants. I thought they had yeah. great songs. and But also, you know, with the guitarist arrogance, I thought I could do it better than that. And um, but Adam always said, and, and you could, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Adam always said, and I told him this years later, and he said, "Why didn't you ever come and tell me I can do it better than that? I can't come to your band and say I want to throw your guitar." <laughs> you don't know me. So it took um, Adam leaving the dance for him to come to you and 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 start the second incarnation really so then, this right? is all in a matter of days it's in all, a week maybe yeah and um meanwhile 
unbeknownst to me, Malcolm had been working with the ants on this new kind of like, you know, tribal indie rock sound or whatever the fuck it was. And then it all went wrong in one rehearsal. Um, and uh, Adam, Adam, the story he tells me, and I'm sure it's true, he walked in one morning, all right, because yeah, very, Adam's very enthusiastic, with all his, his little notes and his lyrics, and just, yeah, yeah, let's get going. And, um, and, uh, and Matthew, I think the Matthew Gisso said, no, I'm leaving the band. Oh, mm. right. <laughs> oh, all right. And then, you know, Lee, the vice of the song, said, yeah, I'm leaving too. And Adam said, it's the, and the immortal words I said to Dave, well, it looks like just you and me then, Dave. <laughs> oh. and he said no but I'm no <laughs> and they went off to form Bow Wow Wow right they went off to form Bow Wow Wow and so Adam was obviously these are his friends I mean just rejected by him three, three best friends of his thoughtful yeah. and your band and um, didn't know what to do and apparently went round to Jordan's house and said I don't know what to do I've just been chucked out of my own band mm. why don't you give Marco a call he's good he said that's a good idea, so we didn't have my number. So he actually <laughs> came up on the train, and it was one of the first nights I'd ever spent the whole night out. Uh, I wasn't actually home. I hadn't come back from some party. And put a, put a note to the door saying, give us a call, Adam. I thought, Adam? I thought, yeah. <laughs> I called him, and of course, in true punk spirit, he wasn't in. Um... But anyway, couldn't go back later. And then we started talking and we had both come to this realisation where obviously he had no back. We, we, we just sort of come to the end of, you know, we got as far as we could go. and not even, We hadn't even got as far as we could go. We'd gone straight off the end of the pier. And it's like, mm -hmm. and, and we were drowning. It's like, what are we going to do, you know? And yeah. it was just this, this, both, this, this sort of, this thing both happened, this happened to both of us in the same week. You know, us both walking about separately, going, "What am I going to do now? What am I going to do now?" You know. So, out of this comes the second incarnation of Adam and the Ants, and yeah, and it you... was born, it was born in this complete frustration. So, we're not doing. I'm not doing that again. I'm not doing yeah. that. And he said, "No, I don't want to do that again. Let's do something else." So then there was like, so Adam had all these ideas, you know, that Malcolm had gave him. Mm. I said, well, that, that, that sounds like a good idea. And he said, yeah, but the Malcolm's idea. I said, but you paid him a grand. You bought them ideas. And you don't really have a grant to spare. So um, they're, they're now your ideas. So let's use them. Yeah. And in the end, we're doing it in a completely different way from them anyway. Yeah. So and was that part of the reason why? Sorry, go on, Stephen. No, no, no. Go ahead, Peter. I was just going to ask, was that one of the reasons because they were, they were your ideas? Um that, that, that's how the name stayed as Adam and the Ants. Was there ever any talk of it, it was, becoming? No, I, mean, he, it, it, I mean, there was a conversation about, you know, I don't know, you know, should I, should, should I, I don't know if I'd want to be Adam and the Ants anymore. I said, no, no, you built up that name. You've got to follow him. Use it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, well, he is he, Adam Ant, and his real name, of course, is Stuart Goddard, isn't it? And nobody yeah. really, apart from diehard idiots like me, would, would know that. <laughs> no, he tells everybody. How does he? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so what do people actually call him? Um, do they, do they call him Adam, right? Gotcha. The first Stephen, sorry, what were you going to say? He said, he said, "Actually, my name's my my, my real name's Stuart." Yeah. So, uh, Kings of the Wild. Actually, you're... sorry, that that came out of a thing like we had both wanted to buy, although we couldn't afford it. We couldn't could hardly afford bus fare. Some mm. some uh, Stuart Sutcliffe art that was that we'd seen in a gallery in the King's Road. And we wanted to buy some of Stuart Sutcliffe's art. <clears throat> we didn't have any money. And I said, oh, I saw these great Stuart Sutcliffe paintings the other day, but you know, I can't afford them. Yeah. And um, he said, well, my, my real name's Stuart. I said, oh, is it? So at this point, you guys are, uh, you're doing Car Trouble Part 2. You know, it's you're doing it as a, to fulfill a contract single. You have John yeah, Lost, yeah, yeah. the future yeah. drummer for Culture Club. Yeah, yeah. At, you know, at this point. So... You released this song, and what <laughs> happens? It, nobody liked it. Um, no, <laughs> we, we released this song, and for us at that time, I think it got to fifty-one 
I mean, that was about 50 places higher than we'd ever been anywhere yeah. near the charts. And, yeah, and yeah. you were, and you were, by the way, you were number one on the UK independent singles chart. Really? Yes. You were number one on the UK independent singles chart. And then oh, okay. the next well, month, you I, sort I of then it. got the full band, and then you actually did Kings of the Wild Frontier at this mm. point. So, yeah. Now, Car Trouble, a, a fact about Car Trouble is a, a, good, a good school friend of mine at the time, and I would be about sort of eight or nine years old, maybe he's in 80, 81, when I first started getting into Adam and the Ants. He said to me, because I was excited about Stand and Deliver being my first single and Kings being my first album, and he said, Peter, Peter, have you heard this awesome song they've done called Car Trouble as well? So so there was a fan of Car Trouble out there. <laughs> and there was he got... a fan of Car Trouble. What, what I liked was, like, because for some contractual reason, that I, to this day, I, I can't even... I forgot what the reason was. He didn't want to do... We had... Kings of Royal Frontier, we had this new sound lined up. He didn't, he just had, he owed Do It Records one more, one more single, and he didn't yep. want to use, he didn't trust them, he didn't like them. Um, and he said, let's just do a, redo an old one. He said, let yeah. do Car Trouble. Yeah. Or Car Trouble Part Two, which just became right. Car Trouble. Mm. So you're doing Kings of the Wild Frontier, and this is, you know, your sound on this album, and I said it earlier, is a combination of sort of rockabilly and surf with a punk rock attitude. And we really hear this on, uh, you know, a lot of the, the tracks on the, on the album, you know, stand and deliver gets into that and Scorpios, and Picasso, et cetera. So how did you get to that point? Why go that direction with your sound? Why go, this is, this is going to be, because it really is between that and that sort of Burundi drum beat is, mm the trademark of the band and you know really resonated how did you go this is the sound that i want to have because it's very it different all, than what you had done it was all the ideas i'd had in my head for five years mm. it just came out so suddenly i can get out all, all out of my head i can just do everything that i want to do and you just do yeah. all the things you like and you just pick you know pick and mix from all different places and putting it, putting it together in a different, I don't know, is, I've never understood what post-modernism is, but maybe I think it's post-modern, I don't know. But you sort of know what it is, but you don't. You wouldn't know how to describe it to someone, would you? Because we all yeah. kind of you know what it means, but how do you say what it is? Yeah, like Blade <laughs> Runner is post-modern, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, and, absolutely. And it, yeah, and, and, and is it post-modern? Well, that was the great thing at that time was there were so many different types of new wave. You had, you know, you guys were the new romantic postmodernism, and there was all these different sort of subgenres that 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 you know that that were being created at that point in time, and you had a unique sound that no one else really had at that point. Bow wow wow, being similar but yet very very different, and I think it was your guitar that really vaulted the band and gave them the longevity that they had because of this. You didn't just strum an instrument to strum it. You would do little, little bits and little flourishes and flurries and unique sounds to add texture. And that's one of the things that I love about anime and the answer is the deep texture of the music. And you are absolutely at the core of that uh, and coming up with that. So are there any tracks on that album that really stand out to you where you cr really work to create a unique guitar part or do something interesting or, um, or create this sort of I mean, aspect? All of it was, all of it was trying to really, really kind of make a, make a statement using all the things that we, you know, that, that we, this is our kind of the first and last shot, really. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. let's just put everything in the kitchen sink in there. Let's put everything, everything you've been listening to for the last, since 1972. Let's just mm. stick it all in. Now, what I struggle with, in a, in a sense, on all of Adam and the Ants is that I don't think there's a there's, there's not a song that I don't love. And that's quite rare that you find an album where there's not a, a song that you you think, oh, that's just a, a throwaway yeah. track or a filler track, yeah. And right from the get-go, and to this day, I, I pretty much, I can't think of a song that I didn't absolutely love. So I guess that comes back to maybe why you might struggle to answer that question there of what was there any particular one that that, that meant something oh, there wasn't more. a particular one because it was all it was all it was yeah. like the album was like kind of one big track really yeah it was it flowed so perfectly yeah. it, yeah, it really, really does did. yeah with, with dog eat dog sort of doing the beginning and you really setting the tone rhythmically 
where you've got mm. three very different guitar sounds going on at different points within the song leading into, you know, Ant Music and Kings of the Wild Frontier, Jolly Roger, which is completely mm. different and unlike anything else on that album and how that came together. Mm. Yeah, and over and time, I, I, I've appreciated different tracks throughout my life. I mean, when I was a young lad, I was all about the, the singles. I mean, I loved them all, but but now going back to it, I'm still getting new stuff from it to this day, the meaning of some of the lyrics and things like the human beings and Killer in the Home as I listen to them again. Now I'm thinking, these are fucking good tunes. And, yeah. and they always were, but... There's, we, there's, we, no, we, there's no such thing as a perfect album. You always, you always want to go back and redo it. Right. Um, mm. Art art is never done. No, I know it's never done. You want to keep remixing it, and remixing it. but you know, if it was me, I'd, I'd, I'd we'd still be there. <laughs> we'd still be there making it. Of course. So, <laughs> were you were, were you surprised by the reception of the album and how people liked it and how they snatched it up at that point? Uh, yes, yes. And how did that change your life? Now you're in a band that is successful. People are starting to know, you know, who you are in other countries, not not just in the UK. How does that affect you as someone who was struggling and and playing with so many different bands, trying to find this, and all of a sudden you find that magic formula in a bottle? Uh, I think there's a Brian Ferry line that you know that sums up. That now I know there's a future. You know, interesting. Hmm. I don't know what track that's on. I don't. Uh, I, I know the it. lyric though. Yeah, but I know what you're talking about. No, <laughs> so now you're doing this, and now you're taking a look at because, of course, as soon as you have a successful album, you have to start looking at the next album. So, do you say we want to do this differently? How do you approach a second album after you've now had success? Very really, really hard. Yeah, mm. well, the sophomore album is always hard, and everybody says that that's the hardest album is that second one, one once you have a hit album. So how do you approach that? How do you not get too deep inside your head or not try to change things, but you also don't want to redo the same thing? You don't want to make a you know, part two for, the, for that album. So how did you approach that album and how you were going to do it? Um, I don't know. I mean, with, I mean, there was a sort of years gap where, yeah. where, where our lives had completely changed. Mm. Yeah, because you're 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 touring and people yeah. want to see you, and yeah. and you're playing together. You're gelling as a band. Are you writing while you're on the road, or did no. you decide to kind of take a break when no, you were done? That was, that was always the management thing. It's like, well, you know, okay, you're touring, and then. Um, I mean, I, I think I did have this conversation on a plane once. So, um, yeah, so you, 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 you'll be back You'll be back Saturday, uh, and then Sunday you can write the new album, and then you can start it on Monday. I mean, can't write an album <laughs> <in a plane. laughs> uh, <coughs> But you were literally were all over the place in the yeah. early 80s. I mean, it, I mean, when, when you think how technology is now, how accessible music is through mm. the internet and the media that we've got today... Back then, you, you still were everywhere. I would tune into Multicolored Swap Shop on a Saturday morning. Adam was, he was never off that show. He was always on there when Little Edmonds, Tiz was, and was Top of the Pops. Something. and <laughs> He was. He was, yeah. And how how did that work out for you and the rest of the, the group in terms of, I mean, Adam being a very, very sort of... Um, well, stereotypical front man, really. And um, obviously, I think, in some ways... Probably, reveled in that role did you did you i mean the rest of the ants did were very very well known to the point that we had your names in in ant rap marco yeah. and terry lee yeah, um the, the cab driver's favorite track isn't it yeah yeah absolutely i bet it is <laughs> but how how was that for you i mean are, are you somebody who enjoyed the the attention or would you say you're more of an introverted sort of person did, did, did you know, struggle with them sure. I'm a sort of introverted extrovert, really, or extroverted introvert. No, I, I, yeah. I, I, I was I was all right with it, but I didn't particularly want to go and talk talk to go and get up and go and do you know early morning television. Mm. No, but yeah. you know, but but the clubs and the girls and all the things that come with that that part's got to be pretty nice. So and the money is the best bit, and the money, yeah, the yeah. money, yeah, definitely. What, what was what was the first? 
big purchase that you made when you got you know real money you got a big check you're like all right i'm gonna go buy this what did you buy i got i I got quid I bought a Gibson Firebird 7 for 800 quid, which isn't a wow. lot of money in 1980. Oh, yeah. That, that's a lot of money then, yeah, yeah, for sure. And is that just something you said when I make it? That's how I'm going to – that is how I'm going to gift myself for all the hard work. That's that's that, that's yeah, what I want. I, then I had, to, had it painted red, painted red like Phil Manzanero's because that's the guitar I've always made. Oh, uh, yeah. I've still got it. I've never used it, but that's not the point. But it's it's symbolic, and that's that uh, that is the great thing, and it is a beautiful shape. And Phil from Broxy mm. Music is an amazing guitarist. So now, so now you're going into the studios, you're recording the second album, um, and this album is going to be even bigger than the first. What was? What, what did you, you think? That? No, well, of course not. No, no. You go in, going maybe this was a one thing. I'm going to enjoy it. We're going to do another album. But was it? We're still going to make music for ourselves, or we want to? evolve what was sort of the your mindset you can only make, you can only make, again without the internet you didn't you weren't bombarded by what do people think yes mm. really so you just try to make the album that you like again try and make the album that you like the, the album that turns you on is there a song you're particularly proud of on that album or Prince Charming, um, we're talking about here, by the way, for anyone yeah, who's not listening yet. Like Prince Charming, I thought was, I mean, was, was the great kind of. Unlike a lot of bands, or a lot of bands now, it's like we've had big success with this big double drum thing, so let's keep mm-hmm. doing it. And we thought we right. have, we've had big success with 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 this big double drum things, and people love it. So let's stop doing it. I mean, it's just completely idiotic, really. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So and, and what Charming, are you? What are you listening to? What other bands? You're talking like 81, late 80, you know, late 80s through the, you know, late 81. What are you listening to? We're still devouring everything, actually, actually, which is great because we didn't have to buy them. So, um, um, I remember Adam coming in with cassette pet. He said, oh, you got to listen to this. You got to listen to Bow Wow Wow. Mm -hmm. I thought you hated them. (laughs) (laughs) He went on and on and on. They betrayed you. He said, "Oh yeah, I don't care about that." Anymore. And it's, um, uh, I mean, you have albums that were released about that time. You know, you you have Pink Floyd's "The Wall." Uh, Queen is going more synthesizer well, and, and things along that, that line. Yeah. Well, no, I, I would assume that 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 you were not at that point. So, but Bowie is. Uh, you know, uh, working there. on a new album, ACDC, you know, Bon Scott dies at this point, and, uh, you know, they're they're looking to to bring some things together, and music well, is starting to change. Kevin, now, Box. while we were doing King's Wealth and Two, he, he'd gone to the shop, he bought Ashes to Ashes, the single. Mm-hmm. He bought it in while we were recording. It's not, not, it, was not nothing, it was nothing like what we were doing, but, you know, we wanted to hear it. Mm. This is Kevin Rooney, right? Kevin, Kevin Rooney, Rooney, sorry. Rooney. Kevin Rooney. Yeah. And, and and it's a brilliant album. And it's certainly very, very different. But you've, you know, you have Talking Heads, Joy Division with Closer. You have David Bowie doing Scary Monsters at that point. The Cure, 17 yeah. Seconds. Ba House, yeah. uh, you know, is is really starting to kind of come into the scene with, with we their sounds. All of it. I'm mostly sneering at it, but we we, we heard everything. Yeah. Mm. And, and I think that comes through. Like, Stray Cats, I think that comes through. Stray Cats and Madness, we liked a lot. Actually, I have to tell you something about about Stray Cats. My brother in law plays saxophone for Brian for the Brian Setzer Orchestra for about ten oh, years, yeah. so he got to know Brian very, very well uh, yeah. on that, and said oh, what a great guy he was. But I could see that you would like his the whole rockabilly sound was very mm. much kind of a deep part of a lot of the different things that 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 you were working on. Killing Joke, one of my favorite bands. They, you know, put out their first album, um, which they sort of steal the Burundi drum beat that you guys were using and sort of mm-hmm. speed it up and and at, become one of the first industrial bands. You have, you know, XTC out there, Devo. Um, mm-hmm. a, you know, it was a very exciting fun. It was very oh, yeah. exciting. I can't, I, can't say I, I can't say I liked everything, but we listened to everything. I didn't, didn't like it all, but it, it's like... Okay, this is not to my taste, but it's very, very clever. Yeah, it yeah, it's going to start to influence what you do because you're being bombarded with different ideas. Like, oh, that's cool. What if I? Yeah, yeah, 
uh, mm. nick this and do something interesting and unique with it so yeah. I, I think a different uh, something else that Go you ahead. had that was very very different for you guys was um that was the look the, mm. the the whole aesthetic visually to to, to the group now how, how did that come about i mean because that was as big a part of of it as anything else for me um the the, the makeup the the little well, hearts we knew, the, we, knew we had to have a look coming from the roxy music yeah mars uh, school of thought because that was one of the things that I bought into at that age. That was one of the things that I loved. I loved the white I stripe. Yeah, and the... We, had, you know, we had Jordan as a stylist. It was different. Now, Jordan, was that Adam's girlfriend at the time, right? No, she was, no, she was, she was never his girlfriend. Was she, she not? Was, right, okay. She worked, she worked in the... She recently died about a month ago. Um, oh. She worked in the sex shop, and she was a friend of, a friend of both of us. In fact, she brought us together. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Huh. So she worked for us as our stylist. Well, she had a brilliant then, idea with, with the kind of jackets and everything else. It's eventually married yeah. Kevin. Really? Yeah. Interesting. And then MTV is starting to hit. Yeah. And you're at, what was your thought when somebody came to you and said, "We'd like for you to do a music video." What was your thought? Yeah, that is not what they said. No, <laughs> I, I'm sure. Yeah. We'd like you not to do a music video. That's basically what they said. I don't Why? Know. Because they're bloody expensive. There's no no way. No, to they run. are absolutely. But it was key. Doing that was one of those things that really helped everybody and get exposure, and and was one of the things that really vaulted that that second album was MTV was now out and was changing how people are were listening to music before, and looking at music. Before MTV, there was like you know the music video hadn't yet started, and record companies were very late to spend. What you know, forty grand on a video, which is the same yeah. as you just spent on your album, right? Mm. And to, they took a lot of you know arm twisting to get them to do it. And by yeah. the way, for for those of you listening, MTV at one point used to play nothing but music videos all day long. Believe it or not, and it was great. And that's where you would kids like me would go and sit. Uh, I would watch that. I would watch some of the, you know, the British versions of it, the things along <laughs> that line. And that's where I got to find new bands. Richard Blade uh, hosted a music video show. And that's where I would see these bands that were not on MTV and go, what the hell is this? That's where I first saw you guys and Robert Palmer uh, when he did, you know, clues and things like that. John and Mary. I, I love that, mm. that, that, that track from Robert and saw that for the first time in the, Wow, or Yaz and and all these or Yazoo, all these different bands that were not really coming to the United States. We were seeing that, and that mm -hmm. started to change MTV as we saw a lot of these UK videos, including mm -hmm. uh, Adam and the Ants, and seeing you in this kind of fifties rockabilly look along with Adam and his sort of you know mid mid century romantic look, and like this is an interesting mashup for a band, and the sound was very different than what you thought that the band would look like. It seemed like it would be more of like a spandau ballet and instead it was this hammer to the head with this amazing drums and guitar and yelping vocals that really hit you differently in, in the united states it was unlike anything that we had really seen before and, and for me it was very impactful with spandau i mean it's, you know as, as much as i like spandau they were, i always thought they were sort of roxy light really yes they were them them mm. and uh and yeah. uh and uh Duran Duran. Japan, well yeah well what japan was Duran Duran done better you had, you know, Spandau Ballet that was trying to be Roxy Music but couldn't quite get the the link of it, and Talk Talk somewhere in between. So yeah, we, yeah. we were also trying to be Roxy Music. We thought we were. <laughs> One thing, the, only thing, the, the big difference between us is we didn't use keyboards. That wasn't a huge decision. That wasn't a like because people actually do interviews like, you hate keyboards and you're trying to destroy synthesizers. No, <laughs> don't hate keyboards. Yeah. I just can't play them. That's all. Right. It just doesn't yeah. have a place in our sound. Yeah. So, so a massive surprise if you weren't trying to emulate emulate the your influences because I, I I've heard an, an interview with Adam and yourself where that <laughs> went both citing Roxy Music Bowie as your strong influences at, at the time, and I've heard you say on on a number of different um, interviews that For Your Pleasure is your your, your favorite well. album. Yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. It so is a brilliant that, album. It, it's an absolutely awesome album. Absolutely we, we, awesome. we thought we sounded like that, but we don't really. Mm. Huh. 
But, but you put, yeah. I think you get elements of these things, little yeah. hints of things, which which end up in there, and then from that you derive your unique sound and look, and and you make it what you are. And then conversely, you then go on to influence others because I don't think of Adam and the Ants as a as a new. I think of Adam and the Ants as a as post punk, um, and and Duran Duran and, and because and because and they hit later in the U.S., I see them as the begin as part of the 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 new wave movement yeah. of of yeah. music because we caught them with the videos it was prince charming and ant rap mm. were some of the first songs that we had heard over here on this side of the pond so yeah, yeah it's, interesting it's, it's, it's really funny with these labels because always people always trying to you know they were always trying to find them and still are and you yeah. do interviews and they'd go right so you're post-punk or your new wave or you're this or you that and you go I, look i don't know what that means right and, and why do you have to be anything why can't you just be what you are well right. <laughs> People we, uh, like to categorize. Yeah. They do, don't they? Pigeonhole they things. Do. They do they like really to pigeonhole. Do. I still so don't now, do. I still don't know what post punk is. Oh <laughs> no! no I, I, guess, yeah. I don't. I don't really know what new wave is. I mean, sort of the B fifty twos. I mean, that's sort yeah. Of, yeah, <laughs> I would agree with that. Sort so now it's so now, happy pop. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Yeah, I think, and, and that's exactly what it was. Was people after you know hearing the protest songs of the of the '60s and glam rock of the '70s wanted something that was you know different, that was upbeat and kind of happy and uh, at the core because of what was going on in the world and coming out of that post punk era. So now it's early '82. You guys win a Brit Award, you win a Grammy Award, and you're mm -hmm. like, all right, time to go do something new. How does that conversation happen? Where you're like. Yeah, we're gonna kind of scrap this and just go to Adam Ant and do things differently. What was what was we the genesis done, of that? We had we had done this gigantic kind of you know welcome to my nightmare type tour, the Prince Charming tour, with the scenery and dancers mm. and hairdressers and ships and you know, and it's like this is too much to lug around. We couldn't afford to take it to America, and it just got too big. It just got too big. We, we, we just couldn't control it anymore. Mm, you didn't God. know. You, you didn't know the names. Of, you, you'd never met half the people who were working for you. Yeah. So you decided to go. All right, we're going to break up this larger and go yeah. smaller. And something what was something that we can control? Something we've got. You know, the yeah. again. And, and you were and you were getting tired of touring at this part. I'm going to assume too. Oh God, yeah, yeah. I was yeah. yeah. Touring. So you take some time off, you and Mark, uh, you and Adam sit down and how do you approach the first, you know, the, the, the first solo album, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at friend or foe and how do you approach that one differently than an ants album? What do you say, you know, do you go, we want to just continue linearly or are there things friend that you want to reset or do differently? Friend or foe was, although it doesn't have anything like it, it was supposed to be like the sun sessions. Interesting. And I, I could see that. Yeah. It definitely goes back to more rockabilly roots yeah. at times. And the guitar parts are, they sound simpler, but they are more complex in many yeah. of the songs. I mean, you keep saying rockabilly, but the thing is that we don't like rockabilly. No, but it is, there's definitely that surf rockabilly sort of sound yeah. within it at that point. And not that you're trying to be a rockabilly band in any way, yeah. shape or form. But it is that, you know, Link Ray, Blue Suede Shoes, Sun Sessions sort of guitar sound, the big fat guitar, um, mm. you know, at many points with then layers of texture. As you look at things like Here Comes the Grump and, you know, Desperate But Not Serious and songs along that line as you're starting to bring those together. So yeah. it's, mm. it's brilliant how you merged it all and did that. And you find success with this. Does that does it surprise you, or did you think, yeah, we'll go do a this other thing, and maybe it won't be as big, but I won't tour as much, but it'll it'll still pay the bills, or um, I had bills to pay by that time. No, I, I would. Hang on a minute, someone at the door. Yeah, I blame you. All right, where were we? We were at uh, friend or foe, friend or foe, weren't and we? I want to turn it back to Peter because I know you know. Uh, any thoughts or kind of thoughts about going from Prince Charming into Friend or Foe or the album Friend or Foe itself before Strip, which Friend mm. or Foe really puts Adam on the map in the States. Yeah. So that's mm. when we're like, all right, we got to get him over here. That 
you know, Strip, Viva La Rock, all the stuff that's going to be hitting over the next well, few I mean, years. The thing about Fendel Furries, and it's the thing about everything we've ever done, is Adam will come in, or I'll come in, and, I'll, and he'll go, Goody Two Shoes was like, he said, right, I want to do something like Gene Krupa. I said, all right, let's do Gene Krupa then. Never having heard Gene Krupa in my life. Really? And then discovering later, he'd never heard Gene Krupa ever in his life either. <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> and it doesn't sound anything like Gene Krupa because Gene Krupa was, was a drummer. Was. And yeah, he did Sing, <laughs> Sing, Sing with Glenn Miller and things like that. Wow. Okay. <sighs> So friend of uh, four was uh, really when when it hit in the split. I told was that? Adam that Gene yeah. Cooper is big drums with brass. He never heard it, but that's what someone right. said. Wow, that's a riot! I love that. All right, I mean, yeah, no, that like, that, that was when he really I don't hit know over if here. We are the only people on earth ever to be influenced by things we've never heard. Mm. Wow! Wow, crazy stuff. <laughs> influenced by things we think we've heard. Well, I mean, Goody Two Shoes hit number one in the UK, and yes, then it definitely hit in the United States. It was a top ten single, uh, you know. Here, uh, mm. different bands, you know. Now you've got different folks coming in for touring. You've got members of the Fingerprints. You have bassist Chris, uh, you know, Chris Constantinow from Bow Wow Wow is coming in and joining you guys in the band once again. Sounds like it's starting to get big again, and I think that was something that you were sort of against. So what are your thoughts well, at this point in more touring? I wanted it to be very, very big. So I just didn't want to... I really didn't want to perform. And looking mm. back on it now, I'm sort of like, why did I do that? I was just so stupid. And I, I, I was just not comfortable with it because mm. I can't even remember how, much, how old I would have been, 25. And yeah. I really wasn't comfortable in my own skin, where, 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 whereas yeah. I am now, or I should mm -hmm. be. And um, I do regret that, but that's a part of, you know, just you can't go back and change. Yeah. Yourself. Hindsight's twenty twenty, isn't it? Yeah. But, um, yeah. Would you, would you say you're more comfortable? I should have embraced it, and I didn't. I didn't. I, yeah. started, I was trying to fight it all the time. I, I wasn't, get where you're trying from. Fight, wasn't trying to fight the success in any time, you know. No. Mm. Yeah, because even at that point on Friend or Four, you you were very very much front and center in the in the video Goody Two Shoes. You're you're part of that video. You're very visible in a, a lot of what comes afterwards. Was yeah. was that something you were you were, you were happy about? Or it was okay. It was okay. You, yeah. you weren't bothered one way or another. <laughs> because, well, well think... at this but, but people are starting to know who you are. They know it's Adam and Marco. Marco's yeah, yeah, that yeah. guy on the guitar on the yeah. guitar. And yeah. that's going to start to bring you that you can't just walk into a pub and have a beer kind of thing. You you can't be anonymous. People are going to start to know you. No, you have to go to special are. celebrity places. <laughs> I would like to go to one of these special celebrity places well, one can. day. But it, um, yeah, okay. I mean, it, it does start to take away your, your anonymity and it will impact your personal life. And that for some people can be the oh, hard no, side of that. For my personal life, it was it worked wonders. <laughs> Fantastic. I was the shyest, you know, I'd never had a girlfriend. I didn't have a girlfriend until I was 17. Wow. Mm. I, I get that. So now you're moving forward. You've done, um, you know, the, for the first album, which was highly successful. You're mm. stripping down the band for Strip. Mm. Um, looking at doing things differently. I know that I think Adam had some sort of surgery or knee surgery or something like yeah, that. Did, and yeah. you sort of sit down. So. Why go smaller with this band after having so much success with with a bigger band? And I, this is, uh, you know, I love this album. There's a lot of great tracks on Strip. You guys are going to play at the Montreux Pop Festival that year. So, what was different about that album as you look at Strip and you know songs like Montreal and I'm Spanish sure. Games and Puss and I love Puss and Boots, which Puss is really Boots. unique. Yeah, yeah. Because we worked with Richard Burgess, who had been you know in landscape and all that. All that. He was he was more. He was the first producer that we worked with that had the, actually an understanding of electronics. Mm -hmm. and although you know we did not, we we, we weren't going to go Kraftwerk or Depeche Mode. That was no. Good. And again, I must stress that I, I do not hate Kraftwerk or Deep Man. I do not hate electronic music. In fact, I love electronic <laughs> music. It's just I can't play keyboards. Yeah, and, and it just and it doesn't fit in with the style of, of what you're doing. It right. it doesn't have to be there. So with 
with that album, you're you're taking a different look, and now you're reaching great success and Live Aid. And I'd, I want to talk about this moment at Live Aid. This is I'm now 18 years old. It's mm-hmm. it's 1984, and Live Aid was one of those moments where I sat in front of the television for that you know all day, watched the whole thing from beginning to end. You guys get the offer to participate. What was that like? Because that had to be unlike any kind of show or concert for not only that many people with, but that much exposure well, I, and not, hanging out I'm with not, all those folks. I'm not in any way trying to denigrate Live Aid or, or, or be cynical about it. Mm-hmm. But I love what Roger Taylor... Um, was it Roger Taylor? I think... Yeah, Roger Taylor said... Uh, of Queen. Of hmm. Queen. They said, wow, you've just done Live Aid and you just played to whatever it was, you know, 10 million bit- people. And he said, oh, yeah, that was amazing. It would take us at least four or five gigs to play that to that many people. Yeah. Hmm. So, no, we'd played to audiences like that before. And it was a great day and it was an amazing experience. But, you know, but but we're musicians and that's what we do. Yeah. What do you remember from that day? Because you don't get that many people who just say, yes, we're all good. I mean, that was the first time that musicians realized the power that they had. What I remember from that day was like, I think, I got to look at the back of uh, uh, Brian May's ants, which I, and I didn't understand how they were interlinked. Ah, the box amps, never, yeah. You're never obviously allowed to, to look at Brian May's amps. And I thought, how <laughs> do these fucking things work? I, started, <laughs> I thought, oh, okay, okay, yeah, it's in series and parallel. Okay, right, you know. I'll take a peek, yeah. Yeah. I had a chance. I had a chance to see them a few years ago, um, and I went not because it was Queen, because for me Queen is Freddie, but mm-hmm. I got and placed myself right in front of Brian because I wanted to watch Brian play. No, he's an amazing player. His guitar work, yeah, and he really is. He and Roger are just phenomenal. It was a chance to see him and him and Roger because mm-hmm. Queen, unfortunately, after 1982, never toured the U.S. again. So I ran out of chances to see them as I got mm-hmm. older. But who else did you hang out with that day? Was there any, did you make any new friends or meet bands that you were huge yeah, fans everybody. of that you had never chance to? Yeah. I mean, you got a chance to meet the Roxy Music guys. You know, Brian's there. And no, I've, never, met, I've never met Brian. You didn't I've meet Brian met, Ferry at that show. Okay. Brian Ferry. In fact, right. about five years ago with my then girlfriend, we went to some strange Brian Ferry gig. It was sort of one of his corporate gigs. It was a corporate secret gig that we were invited to. Yeah. And... She never. She, she, she. I'm a huge fan, and she. She. She is, is my hero. He's my hero. Yeah, him and Bowie. And um, there was some talk of us going backstage and meeting Brian. And I was. I was literally shaking, shaking. Yeah. And I said, I can't. I've got jeans on. <laughs> said, you, you can't meet God dressed like that. I think you're right. You're right. What can we do? <laughs> You need, you need, you do need a suit jacket when you're going to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You need, you, need, you know, there's just, you know, there's a, there's a dress code, isn't there? Well, my goal is on October 12th to go to Manchester uh, to go see Roxy Music. And Marco, if you want to join, I am happy to buy you I'm a ticket. Happy to see, look, I'm going to have another wine because I'm fucking. All right. Sick. I'm happy to, yeah. I think I think you, I, and Peter, and I'm happy to fly across the pond for this. Should go to Manchester and go see that show on October 12th. I'd be well up for that, without a doubt. And we missed the make last this work. time, wasn't it? This oh is yeah, it's they're not going to tour. It? Yeah, this is. They're going to go. Yeah, this will be your last chance to see that those yeah. guys play together on stage. Uh, you know, but this will be the either... Maestro Apollo, is it? Yeah. I believe so, yeah. Yeah, I think it will be, won't it? But hell yeah, I'd be up for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, think I, we to, I, you... I saw, saw Manzanera and Mackay doing like orchestral Roxy music at the, at the, at the uh, some, gig, some big gig we went to. And um, it was very strange. I know that Andy hadn't been well. He had, he'd had mouth cancer for quite mm-hmm. a few years. Mm. And he'd beaten it, and but and he, but when he but when he was on stage, I thought, my God, it sounds like Roxy. He sounds mm-hmm. it sounds brilliant. It, and he'd beaten it, and he was back. You know, which was nice. But what was also odd is we went backstage, 
And I don't know Andy or Phil very well. Um, and Andy was there, and his family came in. You know, I met his wife, and then his family, and it's and like, um, then his children was there, and then his grandchildren was there, and, it, and, and you know, his, his son said, "Come on, come and meet Granddad. Come say hello to Granddad." I was thinking, this is like one of my heroes. Named. He's got grandchildren. Yeah. <laughs> Happens That's to us awesome. all, doesn't it? <laughs> getting well, old. It's it's the one talent we all share. Getting well, mm -hmm. not having grandchildren, getting old. <laughs> yeah. All right, Peter. How do we start to um? You know, we're now at Viva La Rock. Uh, oh. Any thoughts on that album? On you know, I I also love that album. Apollo Nine. I think is you know such a great track. Mm -hmm. Viva La Rock. You have such a great guitar sound on Viva La Rock, Marco. That's just. Just it just grabs you, and it's an amazing way to open up the album too. And I know that was the song that you actually performed at Live Aid. Yeah, so Viva La Rock was actually inspired, and again, a thing we didn't know anything. It's inspired by a thing we didn't know anything about. Uh, it's um, by Expresso Bongo. You ever seen that film? Expresso yeah, Bongo? yeah. No, I've I've not. What is that? I don't even know what it is. What is it about? <laughs> I've not not heard of that. It's it's, it's, it's Soho in the fifties. Yeah, Lawrence yeah, exactly. Hardy is a kind of rock, rock and roll agent. Mm. Yeah, it's just, it's exactly, that. it's a it's a time piece that's really kind of cool and it sort of digs into the early music scene and how things sort of came together where they were going to be at later on and was influential for a lot of folks. Yeah, and so Lawrence Harvey has, has this artist called Bongo Herbert, who's just useless. I mean, it's comedy, so, <clears throat> so we were very much influenced by we recorded it in soho I and mean, it was just like you know it's supposed to be a 1950s glam rock you know yeah it, glam, it's glam rock here rock we go roll. yeah it's 1959 johnny jackson a sleazy talent agent discovers teenager burt rudge singing at a coffee house and despite burt's uh, uh, protest he's really only interested in playing bongos johnny <laughs> starts him down the road to start him and they de they uh, they they uh, they deal they cut However, it is highly exploitive of the youth, and it was sort of that whole sort of story, how that goes. And um, it was not a huge film in the U.S., but I remember uh, a friend of mine from the no, U.K. it wasn't a huge film because it's shit. Yeah, it was not a good movie. Yes, you're absolutely correct. But still, um, you know, Fantastic. it's just, it, it's, it's a trip. But yeah, it's very much the sort of, you know... 50s thing that hit and was um and was very unique uh, around that so and he has to figure out how to be successful and he really can't do it so <laughs> so viva la rock came out of that yeah well, wow it, yes yeah well, <laughs> that you've you've just encapsulated the music business you've just encapsulated yeah. life you want yeah to be that is true but you really can't do it okay and then Apollo Nine, I'm assuming, is was there any other why that why Apollo Nine being yes, it was the first a, I'll tell you to, why to, Apollo to circle, Nine. To circle the I, moon, I, but yeah, I, I can't explain the reason for it. But it was like there was a line in the right stuff, and I love that a, movie. Yeah, it's the bit where he's on the phone, and I think it's like they want to go and interview his wife, and his wife's got a stutter. Yeah. John Glenn, yeah. And he says, he said, no, you can't answer what you, uh, NASA's way out of line. And that's what they're oh, out of line. There oh, you go. Got it. Yeah, yeah, that's his way out of line. And I'll back you 150%. A okay, if you don't want him in the house, they don't have to come in. It's a yeah. it's a great scene yeah. with uh, with John Glenn and his wife. Yeah, ah, oh, NASA's way so out of line. Did, question NASA's then, where did Yabba Yabba get where did Yabba Yabba Ding Ding come from yeah, then? Out of his fucking mind, guys. <laughs> 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 did that come from the same part of the the brain as uh da -di -da -quack -quack? <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's like it's yeah. like flintstones talk is what it actually it's sounds like, like. It's what bam, alum, lot, wham, ba, lot, wham, bam. that's all it yes is. absolutely Fantastic. so after viva la rock peter i'll let you take it from here what sort of happens next i, don't know. Um, I can't remember what happens next <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I, th I think um, sort of in the, in the UK, th this was the point where I think, um, sh shamefully, m my musical interests started to sort of morph and change into other things. And I, no, no, me too. And I, and I, and I sort of, yeah. After that, I think after so sort of the Viva Rock period, I think Adam and, and went went quiet for a 
a couple of years, maybe he took a break because I know he went into the acting for a while. Yeah. And yeah. I saw him in one thing where he was in an episode of that um, Edward Woodward thing, The Equalizer, which I used to love that show, um, Robert McCall. But then he came back, and I, I, I'm not sure if you were, were you working with him when he came back and did The Room at the Top. Yeah, stuff I, did, I, I, I wrote Room at the Top and I played guitar on it, but a I was actually 89. at the time. So you were what, sorry? I was in Sinead's band at the time. I yeah, because you were in right, Lion yeah. and the Cobra and I Do Not mm. Want What I've Got. And, um, you know, you were playing with her up until 2012. Mm. Yeah. Quite honestly, this is a revelation that must go no further. It's not. He did Top of the Pops with some, I don't know, I don't know who they were, those guys. Um, and he asked me to do it. And I said, oh, no, I'm too busy. I'm rehearsing. I'm, I wasn't. wasn't doing anything. I could have mm. done Top of the Pops. I just didn't want to. Yeah. I don't mm. blame you. I, no. You know? You're you're now working with, you know, you did Spirit Destiny, you did the Slits, you're starting the Wolfmen, uh, you know, later after that, like Department that. S, you're doing a lot of really great stuff and continuing, but still always going back to Adam when he needs you, uh, you know, yes. for Wonderful and Manners mm -hmm. and Physique and and Blue Black Hussar, which you play on, I think, three or four of the tracks oh, on yeah, that album. Yeah. So what do you what yeah. do you listen to now? What are bands? That you like to listen to. Is there anybody out that you think is I making really good or unique music? Records from 1972. <laughs> <laughs> Seems fair enough. Yeah, it was a very good year. <laughs> it was a, there, so. There's no bands today that you no, listen I mean, to. I guess, you know, Arcade Fire. Okay. Um, there's a lot of things I like. I Their new album is really interesting. Arcade Fire. They. It's a. Mm. It's a very quiet album, but it has a lot of it. I, I'm, the more I listen to it, the more I like that album. Is there anybody doing something that you feel is really unique out there or something going, I wish I would have thought of that or done lots that? Of lots of people. That, that's the problem. There are lots of people doing u u unique things. Yeah. Mm. Before, it was like, oh, no one's doing anything, but this guy's doing something good. But now mm. there's lots of people doing something good. Well, well, anybody can sit down at home in front of their computer and can do more in front of a small laptop than you could do with mm -hmm. all of the studio equipment at your fingertips and all the money in the world. You can now mm -hmm. do in your home on your own laptop if you want to. It's how music gets released and people find it now through YouTube. Yeah, I mean, well, SoundCloud, all that. The I'm, whole industry's I'm changed. I'm look, talking to you on this massive system with just three screens in front of me. It's, it's not, and I can really kind of do anything, really. Yeah. Yeah. Man, isn't it? Yeah, because you've you've just got to have a YouTube channel, and a lot of um, there is so much talent out there, but a lot of it is luck and timing, isn't it? It um, is, and that that's true of any career. It's true of my career. I was in right place, right time. I, 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 I really know. like, and, and, uh, <laughs> I really like in the last couple of weeks, look, um, Olivia Jean. That all right? I'm I'm not familiar sure. with that. I'll have to check I, that I'm, out. I'm not either. No, it's, what, what, Olivia, what, Jack White. Proposed her on stage, oh, but about a month ago he went up on stage and said, you know, and we got down on his knees and said, you know, will you marry me in front of this just gigantic audience? I was thinking, well, she said no. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, she's in. Uh, she's in the Black Bells. That's right. The Black Bells are really liked. Yeah, that's, that's, that's that, that is her band. So yeah, okay. She's not a little bit more yeah interesting i'd like to just rewind a little bit if i may just before we start winding things up and go back to the prince charming album mm -hmm. very very briefly and ask a couple of questions first and foremost two two tracks would be now, hang on let me just say something marco you could ruin his childhood if you say the wrong answers i'm just <laughs> letting you know this this could cause a lot of therapy so be careful what, what, what you say. No. <laughs> yeah yeah um no i don't i doubt very much it's more of a of a wondering that i've always had um and this happens on a lot of uh, of tracks on a lot of albums but ant rap mm -hmm. the album version is very different to the single and stand and deliver very mm -hmm. minor detail on that and i'm a real nerd here you can tell the the, the single version fades out yeah. and the album the album version has a distinctive very definitive finish what why do those things get changed for singles i, I wanted to have different things i wanted to have I, wanted, mm. I, I thought, you know, you bought the album, I, I wanted the single to be different. Yeah. It, to great, um, uh, what's the word, protest from Adam. It's like, why do we have to change it? What's what, you know, ah, give right, okay. a little bit out. You know, they've got the single, mm. they bought the single. 
Let's just make it a little bit different. Yeah, but and make them go buy the other version. They're going to yeah. sell two versions yeah, yeah, yeah. of it too. I yeah, like, yeah, but I don't want to sit in the studio remixing it. It's already mixed. That's, yeah, but look, we're just doing a different <laughs> thing. You know. Yeah, there's just, I mean, I like, I love both versions. So, so yeah, what you said there, Stephen, the, the system's working because I, I would have gone out and bought every single thing I could. Um, I, I want to try and find it. It's probably in my dad's loft somewhere, but I've got, honestly, I've got Adam and the Ants annuals. I've got rulers, pencil sharpeners, you name it. I had it. It's probably still. Have you got Adam's makeup? I never did. The one thing, the one thing I'd, I've never ever done it. And Stephen, you said I've got to do it at some point. I always wanted to paint the white stripe across my nose. The only thing I ever did was I borrowed my mum's lipstick and I did the scar, the Prince Charming scar on my cheek. That's the only thing I ever did. <laughs> well, we, we, we did a range of Adam and the Ants makeup and we, we've got a big box of it. I remember we got it, but I'm doing it. Oh, great. We've got our own makeup. And it's like, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to do my, going, this is shit. It doesn't cover. And it's just like, <laughs> um, now you don't have to do that anymore which is good mm. the other thing from that album prince charming that i'm always really really interested in is some of the the, the star power that you had collaborating for example diana Dawes on prince yeah. charming so so what was she like to work with really nice yeah are really you familiar nice. with diana diana Dawes, i am i am familiar with diana Dawes. Yeah. fantastic we went to have dinner with her at her house in virginia waters um, yeah, and she was really, and she had a funny husband, Alan Lake. He was nice, nice, but he was, he was, I understand now that he was a bit dodgy. He was kind of, anyway, he, but he was very nice. And he, 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 he said, Do you want to see Diana's cars? And I said, All right, yeah. And he said, We went to a garage and she had about five or six cars, they're all baby blue. Mm. And she said, He's got, she's got a Cadillac and she's got a Jag. Oh yeah, nice. And then she's got a Delahaye. This Delahaye, it, it went, it, it got auctioned for about a million quid a couple of years ago. Mm. And he pulled the plastic off, pulled the tarpaulin off, and you could not believe what you were looking at. It's like wow. it was like a baby boo black Batmobile, and she'd had it oh, custom wow. made. Wow. Well, but, well, Jane Mansfield, though, who she was very much modeling yeah, herself she was, after, she was, she was yeah, had, had the whole pink car that was all custom done. So I think that was sort of her oh, being sort of the British version of that. You've got, you, uh, you got to look at uh, Dinah Dawes Delahaye, and you can't believe what you're looking at. You cannot believe this thing. You, you, think, it, you think you've gone mad, and it's a cartoon. I'm going to have to look this up now. Have so. a look at it. Yeah, Dinah Dawes. Delahaye. Delahaye. Del. Oh, yeah. Thank goodness for predictive search. I wouldn't have known how to spell it. Oh, holy crap. That thing is. Wow. I actually found a YouTube video of it. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Oh, and there's a, pic a black and white picture of her sitting there. But... Oh, yeah. No, I found a video where they're actually, you know going in and showing the whole, her driving it and being there and her sitting in it and what it looks like today. Wow, that thing is insane. <laughs> I remember saying to Alex that we got in it. It's like a I Batmobile, you're right. It is like a Batmobile. <laughs> I got in it and it's just this gigantic, it's like, a, you know, like, you know, my front room. And it's yeah. like, I said, does it go? And he said, we don't know. We ain't started it up since 1956. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, fantastic. What an absolutely amazing car that is that's absolutely so what marvelous. is next i, I want to is there anything you're working on now or you're just well, kind of enjoying life and just i'm enjoying it easy? life Good i've had you. a miserable couple of years as, as the rest of the human race has so yeah. i don't know what i'm gonna do next i don't know what there is to do next it's anything you want that's what's great you are an incredibly that's, that's, creative that, person oh, and that's, that that is that is the curse you can do anything you want right like what yeah mm. Well, yeah. I think the next thing is for us to all go see Roxy Music together and enjoy yeah. a moment seeing our favorite band. So I'm going to invite you personally, if you would like to join us, I will pay for your ticket. I will fly to London and we will go see that concert. Listen, I don't want to pull rank on you, but I don't need you to pay for my ticket. I think I can get us in. All right. Well, oh, if you wow. can do that, then I will fly and join and meet. Mm. But if either way, we would love yeah, to go to that show with you as true fans and someone who's really going to enjoy it. Space to meet Brian, I'll probably fall to my knees. All right. Well, we'll be there to yeah. hold you, and I'll probably well, we'll, join we'll, you. We'll be there to take care of you. 
We'll be there to, we take, will be care there to you. take care yeah. of you. But yeah, we'll dinner, drinks, no. the whole thing. We'll go and we will have an amazing evening and enjoy every single song that they play and watch Phil and how he's playing guitar the whole night and try to well, figure it out. A friend of mine went to see by just, you know, on some of his last gigs before he stopped touring mm -hmm. and they went backstage and she was with a big, huge Bowie fan. And, you know, this woman was like, Oh, it's Bowie. It's Bowie. It's Bowie. And it's like, and he, he came out and said, hello, how are you? And she just burst into tears. Sure. <laughs> I, I get that. There are people in my life that I would be very much the same way about. And all the instruments on your wall, I'm looking at all of your amazing guitars. Is there one that is your favorite? I know that yeah. it's hard. They're all babies. But is it's there one not, that you just yeah, love? It's one that's in storage. My, my, my Les Paul Juniors. Oh. Ah. Those I are gorgeous. I have. I went to, first time I went to LA, I went to the Groom's Guitars. And they had some amazing guitars. And I said, we've got any juniors? He said, and the bloke said, yeah, we've got loads. <laughs> we, we don't put them out because no one wants them. And I said, but that's my favourite guitar. He said, yeah, it's mine too. But we can't sell them. Nobody wants them. And I bought six. Six? $325 each. Wow. wow. And why do you like the short neck? Why? What does that do for you? I don't know. It's just simple, Is it just it? easier for you to kind of get your fingers up and down yes, and I've, do I've more things? Thing, I've got this thing. I, it, it, it's a sort of sub Townsend thing. Where I, I, I do a lot of this. Yeah. And I'm always flicking the switch by mistake. Got it. Got it. it and that, yeah. So, yeah. All right. That is a hell of a collection. I'm guessing you don't actually still have the harp from Prince Charming, though. The harp? No, it was never mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I surmised that. I was just... Um... <laughs> was All just right, Peter, well. you get to ask one more question before we wrap this interview up. One what is your more. final question that you would like to ask Marco? Make it a good one. Oh, We're going to put the pressure on you here. Okay. You, you're not putting me on the spot at all here, are you? Um, okay, let's have a thing. What would be a good closing question? This is going to sound really lame, but I, I guess probably the most logical question to ask you would be, from all of it, the whole journey, Yeah. what would be your highlight? What would, oh, what's the God. thing that stands there's, out? There's too many. There's too many highlights. Too many. too many lows. Let me ask you this. What is, what, is, what is the point when you realized, this is going to be my life? I get to spend my life being a professional musician. When did that, mm. when did that happen where you go, I can take care of myself i can pay my bills i can do everything and oh, i get yeah, to now spend absolutely. my life as a musician i don't know i don't know when that happens because hmm. there has to be a point uh, somewhere between 80 and 82 where you figured that out we're like hey i get to do this for a living this is my dream job and i get to no, do what i'm super you passionate about <clears throat> you don't get to think about think about trivial things about like about how do I actually, what is my livelihood? How do I actually live, you know, you know mm. in the real world? Those things don't occur to you because you're not living in the real world. I guess that's mm. true, yeah. And you don't have time. Yeah. Everyone's just trying to do their best at the end of the day, yeah. aren't they? Everyone's just trying to figure out what the hell it all means. But mm. um, I got one, actually. I've thought of one. Uh, how, on. how would you, if you care, you may or may not, how would you like to be remembered? Um, I don't know. I don't know. What... I, just before Frank Zappa died, they asked him that, how do you like to be remembered because you're going to die? I, I never liked Frank Zappa, but, you know, poor bloke, you know. Um, mm. And he said, I don't care. Whatever. Yeah. And that, I suddenly thought, um, yeah, that's what I thought. I don't care. Whatever. I don't care. But when Bowie died, I thought... Mm. Fuck no! It is. It does. It is important. It fucking is important. What you've done and how you're remembered, and you know, and your effects on people. I don't know how. Do you know? Just I don't know. I'd like to be remembered. Well, I mean, like Bowie, uh, you know, and and Lou when Lou Reed died, Lemmy from Motorhead. I think you brought a lot of, not only a lot of joy to a lot of people through your music. Many people, including myself, 
moments in their life are connected to music. And yeah. some you know, of the you, happiest you, moments oh, in my yeah. life are. What yeah. about me? And it's like, you know, everything's, everything's connected to music. Yeah. And some of the happiest moments of my life are being in my car with friends or doing things and having a song that you wrote, that you played mm. as loud as the radio will go and making it the theme of the evening for us mm. or for the day or having a rough day and hitting one of I the think... songs that you wrote connected. And that 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 is amazing that you touch all these people that you're never going to meet but made their lives that much better. I often think, I mean, I, I know, I know that, you know, Bowie was at the eye of a storm. He didn't really. In fact, a friend of mine did his, used to do his website, uh, my friend Mark, and he actually said, I mean, a few years before he died, you know, it's like, you know, and Bowie said to him, like, I don't think I've achieved what I should have achieved. Fucking hell. What, yeah. what else do you want to do? But it's when you're at the at the eye of the storm, you just don't know. Very interesting. I think that that's an amazing place for us to end this interview. Marco, you have been more than gracious with your time, and it is amazing to kind of go back in time with you. And you were there at this point, and in talk about being in the the eye of the storm, you were there as punk was being born all around you, hanging out with all those people, being in that and influencing. Well, that's that's the point. Like it was Peter all around you. I didn't decide. I didn't. I didn't know. Oh. It was just there. It's it's yeah. life. It's the way life was yeah. at that moment, and you live life. But in I retrospect, being able to look back at that, I actually made quite bad decisions because that was not. Had you asked anybody, it's like, mm. should I be hanging around with these people who wear swastika armbands and blah and yeah. blah and live in sex? <laughs> yeah, we're hanging out in sex shops. No, no, you shouldn't have at all. But. <laughs> But it's the things that we do do and very often are not supposed to that can have the greatest impact of us and That's later on thing. in life can it's show up. Those are the things you're not supposed to do. Mm. Yeah. I think it's important yeah. to do some of the things you're not supposed to do. I think I, it I gives you balance. Do. I've never done anything I'm supposed to do. <laughs> and you've done it beautifully, and that's the best part. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the best successes are happy accidents, right? All of them are. Yeah. It is, it is as you said it earlier, it is... There are always going to be people who will show up that have more talent or that are better qualified for something, but it's being the right yeah, person yeah. in the right place yeah. at the right time. Yeah. And that is always luck will always beat out skill. But it's if you realize and can take advantage of that moment, that's it's, what it, separates it, folks. And you were able to. It's the freaks who don't fit, don't really know what they're doing. Mm. And they're just guessing and they're just, they may look confident, but they're not. They're floundering. And, yeah. You know, yeah. We're talking about Lady Gaga here. I mean, she doesn't know what the fuck she's doing. <laughs> so, no, but she's doing it beautifully. And well, yeah, you know exactly. what? People are lining up behind her because she has become their icon of, hey, I'm on the outside looking in and come join me. And I love that. Uh, she's fantastic as Lady Gaga. I completely yeah. relate to that. Absolutely brilliant. Elton Musk um, doesn't know what he's doing. Elon Musk, no. He has no clue. No, no, no definitely But not. he's doing it well. I give him points yeah. for it. And it's, it's sort of like, after the what I mean, obviously it's a completely different person to anyone I've ever met, but I mean, it's like, mm. does, he often, does he ever think, how the fuck did this happen? He probably does, yeah. I mean, I same thing. I think we all do. I think yeah. we all do. I, th I think it's important, though, completely. not to get too deep into your head and go back to this is my passion and this is what I want to do and that's what should drive you. And I think you've done that. And I think that mm. is the mark of any successful musician is staying true to yourself. And I think you've done an no, amazing job what, of that. I think that's the mark of any successful person. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. and like him or not, and I don't like him, and I don't think anyone does, is Trump. And mm. it's like I also often used to think about Trump Although he's like narcissistic, he's a fucking fascist and a bully and all that, yes. I know, I know 100% he sits in the end of the bed going, what the fuck am I going to do tomorrow? Yeah. He, he, his, yeah. Yeah. he wings it. What have I done? Yeah. But we yes. all wing it. That's the, that's the whole, you know. Hell yeah. We all wing it. Hell yeah. I go to work every day thinking that. I really do. And We and all people, do. We all and people, do. We all do. And I do people too. Seem to, people seem to think that I'm half good at the shit that I do, and I'm trying to like <laughs> the imposter oh, syndrome no, thing. No, I think no. we've all we've all got it, haven't we? I, I think we're all. You put a wing in it. 
what do I do now? Oh, fuck. He's asked me a question. I don't know the answer. I've got to make something up in like a nanosecond. Yeah. It is about yeah. it is about it is about finding that persona and putting that persona on when it's time to do it and doing it well, but staying true to yourself. And I think that's the thing. And I think Marco, I think I don't know. I don't know how to not stray to. There are I people who are. There are people who want to be what others want, and they get led astray or they listen I to want too to be many what people. Want. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Marco, you uh, will be remembered as a great guitarist, as someone who was in the middle of the evolution of some amazing music and someone who brought a lot of joy to a no, lot. I don't people. know if I said this to you last time. I said, I've, I've said it in so many interviews and people just don't understand. But I think mm. you will. So with the punk thing, people say, you know, you went to the shop because you're an individual and you're you know, really kind of like, you know, and you're kicking against the establishment and you didn't care what people think. No, I went to the shop because I wanted them to like me. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. I, I get that completely. Yeah. That makes perfect sense to me. And I was mortified if I would wear a thing that Vivian wouldn't mm. like. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That makes, that makes complete sense. Complete but sense. you were true to your craft. And when it did come time for you to shine, you spoke up and you wrote some, you That's wrote some horrible, amazing that, music. That was, that was the horrible realization I had in bed in, uh, one day in about 1977 going, why doesn't anyone do stuff like, you know, like T-Rex or rocks anymore? Why don't they do it? I wish someone would do it. And then you mm. try and go to sleep. And I, try, I remember, I remember doing this, like going to sleep and then going, oh God, it's me, isn't it? I have to do it. You have to do it. And yeah. you did. <clears throat> Why doesn't somebody actually hang on? I'm somebody. Right. I could <laughs> yeah. do Wait a minute. It's <laughs> like this podcast. That was terrifying. I... You think, oh, maybe if I pull the covers on my head, maybe it won't have to be me. <clears throat> I've been wanting to do this 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 show or show like this for 10 years and kept putting it off and wait, somebody else will do it. Nobody did. I'm like, it's time to do a show like they this. They won't do it. There you go. They yeah. won't do it. It's, it's horrific. You have to do it. You have to fucking do everything. Yep, you do exactly. And we're just doing this because we love it, aren't we? I, I don't think either yeah. of us give a give a damn if one person watches it or however many people watch it. It's you've got to do it because you want to do it, and you're getting yeah, something out of it. And, and that is the secret of success. Yeah, that is the secret of success. You do it because mm. you want. You're not doing it for money. You're not. You, you're not likely to make any fucking money. No. No, my, my father once said to me, find something you would do for free and get someone to pay you to yeah, do it. And it. that is mm. the success. And I have, my father passed away earlier this year, but that is something that I've stuck with and I have been lucky enough to do most of my life and will continue to do. So, yeah, I that's, I have, that's a great I, have, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't really have any money problems, but you know, I, <clears> and I haven't had since the, the age of <clears> 21, really. And it's like, but if I had to make some money tomorrow, mm -hmm. I don't know how. That's interesting. That is really interesting. But um, we're we're happy I, to help if that ever happens. But I don't we, think you're ever going to need that. No, <clears throat> I, I I am in need of a couple of hundred grand, <clears throat> if you could possibly. All right. Well, we'll see what we can do. <clears throat> we'll we'll put the word out. We'll see, see I'll, I, I can sell some blood. <laughs> so can Peter and. <laughs> Give us some time. So I think we'll be good. Oh, okay. oh, was, was it crowd? Was it was it called crowd? Please, the crowd right? Cra oh, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you, like a Kickstarter campaign or crowdfunding. Kickstarter. Yeah. If I went on Kickstarter, I said, "Yeah, I Ronnie would like you to send as mm. much as you possibly can, as he mm. doesn't want to be poor." There we yeah. go. I like oh, there's that. a Go, GoFundMe as well. That's the other one. GoFundMe. Go yeah, that's the other one. Yeah, that's the one. GoFundMe to be rich. <laughs> There we go. I love that. I think that will be my my retirement plan if I can make that happen. Maybe once couple, my daughter gets out of college. A couple hundred grand. A couple hundred grand. Of, yeah. That's I probably not. I, I could do with, not, but I could do with just idea. under a hundred grand as well. That I'm trying. Matter. I'm trying to get back to London, and I, you know, a couple of million ain't going to do it. No. <laughs> no, it's the same no, out here too. It's different, isn't it? Different scales now. I used to talk about a million quid when I was growing up, and that was a lot of money. Forget but it. it's forget it. Shit, all now, isn't it? Well, it doesn't go go anywhere. Well, um, if I could afford to buy, you know, which I possibly could, if I could afford to buy a small, kind of like fairly nice house in London, 
And it's like, you know, I'm going to spend like two, three million quid. And it's like, yeah. You can I'll be at the shop, like, kept trying to buy a fucking bottle of milk with like, yeah. Know, change. No, and the taxes and all the other stuff would just kill you over time. So it just wouldn't yeah. be worth it. That is so true. Because where I live in the northeast of England, my house is just, it's a, it's a three bed semi detached house. And what I paid for that 10 years ago wouldn't get me a one bedroom flat down in London. I have a oh, seven yeah. I have a seven bedroom house. That mm. would not buy me a one bedroom house in London. Yeah, it's so mad, isn't it? The same thing, but it's where you are. But the thing ma- is, it's matters, what, doesn't what, it? what's making me sort of, you know, what, what's, what's been, you know, it's like I don't want to go back to London because <clears> it's <throat> great capital or it's it's paid the great. It's my home. It's where I was born. Yeah. And yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, because you've been up there where you are now for quite a few years now, right? Yeah, about six years. Yeah, that's right. I get that. I get that. I mean, I I love London myself. I've travelled there many, many times over the last few years for my own job, and it's an amazing, an amazing city. Love it yeah. a bit. And I went through again the other week for the first time in two years. Uh, first time I travelled in ages, and I just pass passing through. I was in I was in Gloucestershire for a work thing and i got the train back via london paddington then tube to king's cross and then train home to darlington and i just thought god i'm only here for like a few seconds but it feels so good to be there's just something about london it's got that like a lot of cities in the world i guess it's like yeah, london new, well, new york it. paris that well, it's, 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 it's you know I, I you know i was born there so mm. No, I love I love London. When I get off, you know, when mm. I get flying to Heathrow and get off at Paddington Station and walk out, I always get that. Mm. That and Chicago, where I grew up, it's the same thing. As soon as I see it's the skyline of Chicago, it just it's it hits you. Up. I like Chicago. I mean, obviously, I don't want to live in Chicago. I don't you? Mm. No, the weather, the winter there is horrible, but it's yeah. a great, very friendly. It's a it's a small town uh, mentality in a big town. Mm. So, all right, we we should close out the show. Um, so let me let's do that, and then if you guys want to continue to talk, I think that's great. I got to go. Yeah, absolutely. But let's let's wrap it up, though. Let's at um, least wrap it up. So, Marco, this was absolutely amazing. You have been incredibly gracious with your time and you know, sharing all of this. Sunday afternoon. What else would I be doing? Oh, well, we we appreciate you taking time to do this and to reach out. So we do. Uh, it means a lot, Peter. Since Adam and the ants and Marco and all of this was such a big part of your youth. I want you to close out today's show. Yes, you close out, Peter. Oh, thank you so much. Well, Marco, just to echo what Stephen has said, I'm absolutely thrilled to bits that you agreed to join us. It's meant the world to me. Uh, you and the band were heroes to me growing up when I was a young age. You meant a lot to me uh, at, at that time and, and still do and still do. I uh, I think you've, you're, you're a lovely human being. You've been so <laughs> wonderful to talk to. Um, you can probably, t- I have Tourette's and I've been twitching away throughout this interview because I'm probably a little bit nervous talking to one of my childhood heroes. So it's probably come out a little bit. So, <laughs> but I'm very open about that, but it's meant the world to me that you've given this time and, and, and talked to us and it's, it's just been so, so great. So thank you, um, from the bottom of my heart for doing that. It's, it's, it's wonderful okay. for me to do so. Time. Um, but um, but yeah, um, we will be back again very soon with another episode of 10 Songs. You can reach out to Stephen or myself at uh, the email addresses you can see on the screen. If you're listening um, on Spotify, it's uh, peter at 10-songs.com and Stephen at 10-songs.com. We're also on Twitter at 10songs3 and our website is uh, 10-songs.com. So thanks for tuning in and we appreciate it as always and we'll be back real soon. Take care, folks. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you later. Bye.